Hi, my name is Brett Kingman and I'm sitting on the front doorstep of my house on Mornington Peninsula in Australia because I'm about to go uh, film a little story with my mate Josh, a story which will probably blow your mind if you're of the guitar fraternity. On February the 3rd, 1959, the music world lost three of its greatest uh, rising stars, Buddy Holly, The Big Bopper and Richie Valens all died in a small light plane crash uh, heading to their next gig in Minnesota. A terrible time and unfortunately, ironically I guess, it made all of those performers uh, posthumous big, big stars. Behind that light plane was the tour bus full of the remaining musicians and all of their gear. Now I have an interest in that because we know that Buddy Holly played a very early Fender Stratocaster, a 1954 uh, perhaps even a prototype 1954. Where is that guitar? Follow me for the story, definitely the story of the week, maybe the story of the year. Let's go. Uh, this little fella here, I'll tell you the great story about this. We had, we were touring America in um, Linda Ronstadt's uh, bus with Lee Sklar and Billy Thorpe, you know. Mm -hmm. After one of our gigs, um, I was having a few drinks with this guy who was a, um, guitar broker, he he got the guitars for bands like ZZ Tops, he'd, he'd go and source them um, and then, you know, being a broker he'd obviously buy them and on sell them to uh, guys like ZZ Top and Eric Clapton. Anyway, I said, oh man, I love a 54 Strat because that's that's just the, the holy grail of Stratocasters and he said, oh, I know where there's one for sale. And I said, oh, okay, well, where is it? He said, it's in, it's in Lubbock, Texas. And Lubbock, Texas is only a couple of hours down the road, so I got up really early uh, one morning and, uh, well the next morning actually, and, and drove to Lubbock, Texas and um, I found this guitar, went to a private house and this guitar had been um, sitting under the uh, under a, a bed for a long time, hadn't been used for probably 20 years, you know. And we're talking 1979, 1980? 19, yeah, probably the end of 79, perhaps. Um, so, uh, theoretically, that was 20 years after the unfortunate passing of, of, uh, of the death it's, it's exactly 20 years, yeah. The guy t said to me, well, I've had a deposit from a, a, a Japanese buyer, but he's never come forward with the rest of the money, so I'm happy to sell it. You know, I said, well, <coughs> sounds okay to me. Um, so I bought the guitar for three and a half thousand US dollars. Now the Australian dollar at the time was a dollar fourteen. So I actually paid three thousand Australian dollars for that guitar, <laughs> which you know in 1979 was a fair amount of money. Yeah, that's kind uh, of before were guitars, you know, identified as being collectible. Then in 79, even no, like 59 standard Les Pauls and No, seven. not really. I mean, to be able to pick up a 54 strap for 3,500 US is a bit ridiculous when you think about it now. Uh, what happened 20 years later was what was the interesting part of it because uh, I, was, I was phoned up by um, Mick Hamilton, who's a guitarist in Melbourne, and uh, he, he was recording some songs for another artist, a Melbourne artist called uh, Colin Cook, and they were apparently uh, songs that had been found only in the last few years, this is going back to the year 2000, uh, behind a, a sideboard in, a, in, a, in an apartment in New York that had been written by Buddy Holly that, and never recorded. So, you know, my first reaction was, well, how do they get to come to Melbourne to be recorded by Colin Cook? You know, I, couldn't, I didn't quite understand that. Anyway, I said, yeah, okay, look, uh, Mick said, can you bring the guitar into the studio because it's a 54 Strat, Buddy Holly, Buddy Holly had a 54 Strat, blah, blah, blah. So I took the guitar along and there was a guy there who was a real Buddy Holly, uh, well, call him a nutcase if you like, he just knew everything about Buddy Holly, he knew, he knew Buddy's brothers, he knew, uh, he stayed at Buddy's house uh, in Texas, uh, and I opened the guitar case and he said, that's Buddy Holly's missing guitar. And I said, what are you talking about? You know, he said, that's, that's the guitar that went missing the night Buddy Holly died. And I said, what are you talking about? You know? And he said, Buddy Holly had three guitars. He had a 54, a 56, and a 58. The 56 got stolen in Canada on a, a tour. The 58 is in the Buddy Holly Museum in Lubbock, Texas. And the 54 disappeared the night he died. 
uh, on the plane in 19, I think March 1959 for me. February 3rd. February the 3rd. Yep. Um, I said, oh, okay, well, uh, I mean, it didn't really mean much to me, to be very truthful with you. If the guy had said to me, Hank Marvin owned that guitar, I would have gone, you know, I would have gone berserk. I would have paid 18 grand for it, you know. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> anyway, the guy said, that's Buddy Holly's missing guitar. And I said, well, how do you know that? You know, and he said, well, because of the markings on the guitar. Because Buddy Holly played Pete Two and that'll be the day all downstrokes, and he cracked the tops of the pickups, because they're only Bakelite pickups. Yeah. And you can see from the guitar, the tops of the pickups have been broken. Yeah. So he took photos of his guitar, and he took photos, and he had, and he had photos of Buddy Holly's 54 strap that he had at Festival Hall in Melbourne. And they superimpose the guitars over each other, and and this has the identical markings to Buddy Holly's guitar, including the neck markings and everything. So this is a prototype of fifty four. Well, that that's correct? a different. That's that's the next part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, it is. Now, so <clears throat> because of the person I bought this guitar off, and the the fact that uh, the, the photos of Buddy Holly's guitar at Festival Hall. A lot of people are saying this is Buddy Holly's missing guitar. Yep. I never have. I must. I must point out that I've never. You've never made the claim. I've really made. I've never made the claim that this is Buddy Holly's guitar. Um, mm. But uh, people are saying to me, well, it's identical to the '54 Strat um, that went missing. You know, oh, by then, third. by then, 40 years ago. You know. Yes. Um, <clears throat> anyway, I didn't think much more of it. The thing about the Strat is that. This serial number is 1061 on this Stratocaster. Yep. We don't know what Buddy's serial number was on his 54 Strat. Even his brothers who have been contacted about this guitar, never they recorded. don't they don't know, you know. Yep. What, it's never recorded. <clears throat> anyway, I was reading I, I was reading some articles about it because there's lots of articles on the YouTube about not, and, and, and Google about the guitar. And I, I, I read another fact I didn't know about, and that was that Leo Fender, for the first 200 Stratocasters, were all handmade prototypes. And the way you can tell is these prototypes had 100k pots, pots being the tone controls and the volume controls. Yep. So I immediately pulled the strings off this and pulled the scratch plate off because I, you know, I'd never looked inside it. And it's got 100k pots. Right. So this is one of Leo's first 200 prototypes. This guitar was built in August 1954. Uh, it's got the it's got stamped under under the, under the scratch plates. Now it's got the 32nd week of 1954. Now Leo started in March 54, so you've got to take 13 away from 32. Yep. So this is like the 20th week of Leo's prototypes this guitar. Even though the scratch pl well, the, the the what we call the model number plate, the plate on the back, says 1061. And you'd think, well, gee, he's already made a thousand and sixty-one guitars. Well, no, he hasn't, because what at the Fender factory, if you read all the info and see all the photos, they used to have a big, like a big basket full of plates in the back. So, you know, they didn't pull out number one. Just grab them at no, number one could have been one hundred and twelve. Okay. You know, or number one could have been three hundred and forty. You know, they yeah. they didn't work it like that. And the necks as well. They had a whole basket full of necks. You know, wouldn't you love that basket now? Yes. Um, <laughs> but what we do know is that this guitar is uh, August, nineteen fifty four, made in the thirty second week of nineteen fifty four. Uh, hundred K pots makes it one of Leo's prototypes. And if you look really carefully to it, you can see that it's all been hand prone, you know. Um, honed out and etc etc. Um, as for the Buddy Holly connection, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I I, I know that there is a relationship between this guitar and uh, some relatives of Buddy. Um, other than that, I, I'm not sure about it. I, I never made the claim that it actually owned to Buddy Holly, but it, it's a nice story. I mean, if that is Buddy Holly's guitar, that's that's what was played on Peggy Sue and that'll be the day. That's, that's enough, you know. Besides the fact being uh, a prototype of Leo's, um, it's, priceless. It's, the, it's the ultimate guitar for a Stratocaster free, you know. That's, to me, the holy grail. That's where it started. The giveaway is, 
where the bottom of these Bakelite pickup covers are worn down from all of that downstroking, right? Well, he, he, he did Peggy Sue all downstrokes. Right, so it's like... And if you look at the video, or the one or two that exist, it's in about that position too, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plus he was a pretty tall guy too, so... He... Well, yeah, 182, which yeah. is... I'm 182, so he was as tall as me. Yeah. And he wore it down here. Yeah. So he and he wasn't band. watching what he was doing either. He was singing and that sort of stuff, so he probably just bashed away and didn't think about it, you know? Yeah. It's very light. It's ash, of course, because I, I think they used ash um, up until about 56, 57 when they went to Alder. But you could still order ash. Um, beautifully figured neck. Hand carved, of course, because there were no CNC machines back then. No. Um, no. And the frets are uh, almost as new because they'd only been played for a couple of years, really. And they've still only been played for a couple of years, so there's very little wear on them. Um, Nitro's gone down, you can see the wear in, uh, you know, in between the frets, of course, so, so there's a bit of wood wear. Uh, it's just a, it's a, it's a gorgeous thing. Um, yeah. But what I think that... But I mean, I love owning the 54 Strat. Uh, you know, it's of like course. if you're a Fender, if you're a fan of Fender like I, I've always been, it's, it's just, it's, I had to have one. I mean, I, as I said to the guy, if it's good enough for Jeff Beck and Joe Walsh, it's good enough for me.